Okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us and welcome to our How to Raise Leafcutter Bees Q&A with Dave Hunter. Um, so whether this is your first time raising leafcutter bees or your seasoned beekeeper, we're uh, excited to answer your questions. Um, but I do just want to go over a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, first, Thank you so much for everyone who submitted questions ahead of time. Uh, we got a lot of great questions and we will do our best to try and get them all answered in the time we have. We do only have one hour, so um, we'll see what we can get accomplished in that hour. But anything that we don't get to, um, we'll tell you at the end how you can go about answer, or asking your question and we will get back to you. Um, so we've organized the questions to follow the leafcutter bee season. So we'll start with incubation in the spring, followed by summer, uh, yard and garden prep, and then um, we'll end with protecting them throughout this, the winter and spring. Um, and if you have any additional questions, please pop them in the chat box to your right. We have Kylie um, from Crown Bees that will be answering those for you. Um, and then lastly, we'll be utilizing uh, QR codes throughout the Q&A um, to link to certain products or learning pages or programs that we talk about. So if you have your phone ready, you can scan the codes as we speak and it'll take you directly to the page that we are talking about. Um, but if you don't wanna worry about um, messing around with your phone, um, you can, this will be posted on YouTube directly after the webinar. So you can always go back through um, and scan them then. So with that, I will turn on Dave um, and he can introduce himself and we will get started. Great, thanks Kim. Uh, this is always just such a fun get to do. It's uh, transitioning from one season mason bees into just an exciting season of leafcutter bees. It's new and how do we do this? And um, I don't know, I enjoy it. Um, uh, we have learned a couple rules that uh, the leafcutter bee clearly is a warmer temperature bee. And so um, you know, I think a lot of people have been um, you know, querying, when do I get these bees to my yard? Mm. You know when the temperatures are in the upper 70s type of thing so it's um anyway we're here um we're happy to help you guys out and um you know this uh crown bees team is here to help you guys be successful so when you have those questions you know our website's just chock full of videos and and um and words and then when in doubt you know you don't get it there ah, we have you know, a couple of people here that are just helping you you know learn what to do and and what to get so uh, let's fire it away, Kim. Let's go. Great. Okay. So um, our first question is uh, from Rhonda from Washington. Um, and it's a pretty great question, question to start with. It is, how do I get started? Um, I'm in my fourth years with mason bees. Um, I would like to try leaf cutters. So, you know, can I get them from crown bees? What's the last date to acquire them? Um, just kind of what do we do to get started? Okay. Uh, just if you're getting the bees from our, you know, from us, you're able to choose when to get the bees. So there's, you know, you're able to choose a Monday uh, between now, um, let's say May 1st, all the way through into August. So take a week and we can get them to you. Um, to get started, uh, the leaf cutters that we sell are using smaller holes, six millimeter holes. So if your mason bees have finished, um, I would be removing bigger holes and putting in these smaller holes. Or if you're trying to do both at once, you just want to make sure you have a variety of holes in your nesting house that um, handles both larger bees and smaller bees. So um, no issues with keeping one house and just pulling out the nesting material. Great. Um, and then, so as far as when should you buy leafcutter bees? This is another question we have from uh, Jennifer from Pennsylvania. So, you know, at different part of the country. So what, what do you look for when you want to buy leafcutter bees? Um, and Jennifer specifically says she doesn't have flowers on plants until July. Right. Okay. So um, some people out here just trying to add bees to the yard because it's just you know, a thing to do. Other people are looking for workhorses. And so if you're looking for a workhorse to pollinate your tomatoes or peas or beans or whatever out there, um, I would be thinking through um, when you have this pile of, you know, pollen ready to be spread. Um, I'd get to, so, you know, let's just say that the, your, some crop is going to be here July 1st. I would bring in your leafcutter bees uh, a week or so earlier 
so that they're established and already moving. They're still going in a 300 foot radius, 100 meter radius. So uh, that's six acres. Um, they're grabbing and spreading pollen all over the place. So a little bit before. And then, um, you know, uh, a lot of people want to have a set of bees now and then wait two or three weeks or four weeks and add them again. These bees are out there actively flying typically uh, five to six weeks. Great. Um, so I, I'm popping this QR code up there and this wasn't a question, but um, what if someone orders point. bees and then, you know, something happens with the weather or, you know, they're going out of town when the bees are supposed to arrive. Can you change the bee ship date? So, yes, you can. Um, if you can try to do this to us um, a few days beforehand, like um, Wednesday or Thursday, we're actually surprisingly um, boxing these bees up on labels in Thursdays and Fridays. And so they're actually going into our, you know, into FedEx envelopes on these days beforehand. So it's tough for us to try to riffle through boxes of these bees to get yours out. So to pull those out sooner would be great. And then... Um, Appreciate, um, it is a two day adventure as we're shipping the bees from Woodenville to wherever using FedEx. Um, we used to ship these with the post office and get a lot of dead bees because it would take five or six weeks, you know, five or six days to get across. Nowadays it's two days. Um, we're under incubating the bees a hair. So um, in the ship and still warm outside, um, the bees as they arrive should be, the boys are typically out and the girls should be out just a hair afterwards, should be. If it's super warm as it goes, you'll probably have a lot more females out too. Females have dark eyes and the males have, um, in fact, this picture behind me has, has dark eyes. When you see the boys, brilliant green eyes. So there's a big difference. Cool. Um, so do the bees come in cocoons or are they free flying? Both. Um, we've started them uh, two or three weeks ago. Uh, we looked forward and said, ah, how many orders should we make? We're incubating larvae that are in cocoons. And as we move them through their stages, they're almost adult um, bees as we ship them. So I'm going to say uh, both. They are um, almost bees in cocoons. And by the time you receive them, you'll see bees as well. Okay. Um, so here's a good question about releasing the bees. So do I put the bee house or do I put the bee house in the net bag or the, sorry. Um, where do, basically, where do you put the bees when they arrive? Okay. You're going to have a, a tube of bees. It looks like a stick of dynamite. Um, the cocoons are packed in there. I would have them come out of there. It might be hard for the bees to kind of tunnel all the way through. Um, so we, most of our houses have a um, cocoon hatchery. I would take my, um, my bee tubes and uh, open that thing up and just kind of dump them into your cocoon hatchery. They'll emerge when they want to. So um, if you don't have a hatchery, you can just sprinkle the um, cocoons and the bees behind the nesting material that you've got there, not in front. Um, they might blow if they're on top, so just kind of put them behind. The bees will crawl over and work their way out. Okay. And how many leaf cutter cocoons should you release per nesting hole? This is a species that disperses a bit. We know this, and we're sending out a couple hundred plus every time we ship bees. Um, knowing that they disperse uh, in, in, let's say, in 200, you have maybe 80 or so females. Probably 30 females will um, start to nest there in one place. And so if you're getting any one of our big, um, small sets of like 35 reeds or a seven, eight hole tray, that's enough, you know, start there. Um, so roughly to answer that, um, if I give, if we give you 200 cocoons, having about 35 to 40 nesting holes would be a good um, proportion. Great. So we're gonna move into some incubation and release questions. 
Um, this first one comes from uh, Pennsylvania. And the question is, you state that the bees come incubated. Could you explain what that means? Okay, so uh, the leaf cutter uh, starts in the winter as, or you know, finishes the summer as a larva, and it's hibernating through the entire season as a larva. So we've pulled these cocoons out. Um, there's still larva inside there, and we place them into, we have a big, large room that's um, heated to 86 degrees, has good humidity, and we're doing this ourselves, moving the um, the heat from you know 86 degrees, moves the bees from larva up to adult bees within uh, precisely uh, 23 days. Um, you're doing this at home, uh, having a warm room, so like we're on, on top of your water heater is a good place. Just something that's gonna um, keep them warm in a dark room. Uh, it'll move them, uh, typically takes about three or so weeks if you're doing this. Make sure that you're kind of watching the um, bees emerging from, uh, we have like a bee guard bag. You'll find that the males will come out first, green-eyed people, um, bugs. And then when you see those males, ah, that's the time, everyone's about ready, move them outside. Um, so here's a question um, from Kit from Oregon, um, and they ask, I place my leaf cutters in their nesting tubes in the garage until spring. Will this prevent them from developing? The bees will stay in larval form at or below 55 to 60 degrees. So keep it, not even be 65, I forget the exact number, but if it's below 60 degrees, they're typically not going to move into development. So um, we keep our bees here actually at about maybe 40 degrees during the summer months and then push them from there. So if you keep them in your garage, if it's cooler, sure. Or under your house, um, you can keep bees from last year um, in your fridge, but we're always kind of cautious with that because of um, high humidities might get your um, leafy pieces moldy. But so I, I would keep them someplace cooler and then move them to a warmer environment for them to start shifting. Wonderful. Um, so here's a question from Steve from Montana. What if my leaf cutter incubator got a little too warm, uh, like 84 degrees for a few days, will I lose my bees? No, 86 is about uh, fine. And these are a warm temperature bee. So move them um, any heat really 70s 80s um, I've sent these bees down to my dad in Palm Desert and they're doing fine in the hundreds and they just kind of just walk on through they use those warm moments just to move from you know sleepy little larva into adult bee okay. and I've got a question here about our leaf cutter bee attractant so maybe start with for those of us that don't know what is invita bee leaf cutter bee attractant and then the question is um, do I spray the attractant on the reeds before or after I put the cocoons in the reeds? Um, good. So uh, we've learned um, through research uh, that there's molecules in the cocoons that attract a bee or a pest, surprisingly, to uh, nest there beforehand. And so we have a process where we extract um, water-soluble um, molecules into our little vials of, of um, attractant. Um, so there's your invited bee. And it just, we've learned that um, bees tend to nest there than not, okay? Um, so when you are ready to put your bees out, you're just squirting 10 or so little squirts on the face of uh, your nesting materials. And then putting your bees out there, the alcohol in there evaporates, the scent stays behind, um, smell it. it smells kind of leafy but it's um it's something that does work great and what about um where do you put the cocoons after you sprayed on the invited bee oh again you're putting your cocoons um either in our cocoon hatchery or if you don't have a hatchery you're putting um behind your nesting materials even gosh get a little um pizza box and and put all the cocoons in there Make sure there's a couple holes in it and just tape that to the underside or have some place, have this someplace nearby. It's just a 
we're looking to have the bees spread out, not in a very tight bundle. That's kind of hard for them to move through a mass of cocoons. So kind of spread out um, in, a, in a hole or two and off they go. Mm -hmm. And you just want to make sure as well that they're not exposed to, you know, rain or, you know, open for birds to snack on. Um, so, yeah, that's why maybe tucking them behind the nesting materials. If you don't have a hatchery is a good idea. True, true. Nice job, Kim. Um, so I've got a question from Janine from Washington. Um, so one of their wooden bee houses got moldy last year after not taking proper care of it. So can it be cleaned and reused? Um, and if so, what should they use to clean it? Um, a while ago, we would have said bleach because that just does everything. We're trying to be less caustic. And so just taking a house and putting in, um, you know, warm soap and water is would be just an easy piece just to clean the house out and then letting that just dry naturally should um um do all that you want to do uh if you're washing trays um be careful that you're not trying to get too much water on your trays that you've cleaned all the cocoons out we too much water might just warp the boards so we're um being a little cautious just a um a light light washing maybe but very mostly just using a stiff kitchen brush to clean out your uh, wood trays great um here is a question um peggy from oregon they said i raised leaf cutter bees two summers ago and none of them made it um if you remember that was the summer we had temps about 110 degrees in june um could the high heat have been the reason they didn't make it or do you have any other thoughts and Kim, what do you think when she says make it, like didn't survive the trip there or didn't nest? What would be your interpretation? Um, I'm not sure. So maybe speak to both. Um, okay. Um, it start with if they were purchased from us and it was the trip there. Um, and then maybe if it was last season's bees that they raised themselves, what could have been the issue? Uh, so it's important if you're going to be buying bees from us that... Um, we're trying to get you the healthiest bees possible. If somehow in a FedEx truck, they just baked and it's not your fault, it's not our fault, um, let us know, we'll send you out a fresh set of bees, okay? Um, it is coming in an envelope, a FedEx envelope. Uh, that's typically sometimes on, you know, on a door stoop. If uh, this is too hot in your environment, it's not going to the mailbox. Maybe we can ship it to a work address. I mean, that's just, you know, we'll work with you to help you get healthy cocoons. Um, once the bees are there, if they're not exposed to direct sun, uh, the warmth does bring them out. You know, I'm, I've been down there in Palm Desert in 100, you know, plus degrees and the bees are just flying back and forth. So I'm not typically concerned about the um, bees actively flying in there. Um, I might be maybe, if, you know, if it's super hot, I might uh, pull them out of a 100 plus environment, maybe kind of move them to someplace where it's 80s or 90s, like maybe inside 85 or something like that. I might, if you're just trying to incubate these, I might step in just a bit to um, look for a little more success. Okay. Um, and here's a question from Facebook um, that I pulled. They asked, I have a block of a thousand leaf cutter bees and they've not come out yet. Our weather is fluctuating between 50 and 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, I keep the block in the sunshine. Any tips or should I just have more patience? I've had it out for about three weeks. There's, there's two issues. Um, I, I suggest that you, you know, either you're renting this from somebody or someone's given you a, a pile to purchase. Um, it does take a while. Patience is probably um, the right answer um, in this specific, specific case. Um, but it's just a small little history lesson. 20 some years ago, the leaf cut industry had just big old huge blocks of, of drilled holes in their woods. They call them bee blocks, bee boards. And you might have maybe 2000 holes with just all these bees inside there. And they just the bees left out and came back in. Um, what happened 20 years ago is because they didn't realize that there was pest building up inside there, the entire industry almost caved because they hadn't harvested cocoons 
on chalk root was in there. And as the bees would tunnel through, they would come across this spore and carry this chalk root on their hairy bodies as they went out, spread it on the face, left it in the alfalfa outside. And as their bees are coming back in, they're spreading this chalk root back into old holes that already had chalk root in it. And so it's a, it's a, um, the whole mason bee industry learned that lesson and said, ah, let's adjust. From here on out, all cocoons really should be loose cocoon managed. And so I would caution um, purchasing solid blocks from someone who's just doing that because you're probably bringing in pests that um, you can't do anything about. So loose cocoon management is uh, a way we suggest to keep the pest load down. Yeah. But um, yeah, just to, to go back to Dave's point about patience, you know, 50 to 70 degrees, leaf cutters usually need higher temperatures than that um, before they emerge anyway. So, you know, patience is just wait it out for a couple more weeks when temperatures heat up and then see where you're at from there. It's a hard word. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay. We're going to move into some summer flying questions. Um, so this question comes from Texas. If loose leaf cutter bee cocoons get wet in the rain, will they be destroyed? <laughs> That's a tough one. Um, uh, so we're suggesting that the cocoons not be placed out in the rain, you know, more hidden behind things. Um, it's okay. It's a bug. And I'm going to say within these leafy cocoons, is a is a little bee or larva you know developing and they've got a little cocoon not like a thick robust mason bee cocoon they're typically um i'm gonna say maybe if i would you know so they got wet as long as they weren't sitting in a puddle of water for you know a day or two i'd dry them off and just go put them back and and you know see what happens it's good it, it's a tough question maybe um, I'm just going to pull this question from the YouTube chat because mm -hmm. I think that it's um, an important one to answer. Um, which is better? Um, what, I guess it's basically what's the best nesting material? Is it wood blocks that open? Um, is it bee tubes? Is it um, natural reeds? What are your thoughts on that? When we, um, there, there's, two answers um, from a human perspective i want things easiest for me and so um the drilled blocks wood a while ago was easiest for the industry then they moved into um laminates that can be opened up and so the, you've you've purchased one laminate and you're just opening these things up the scent of the leaf cutter kind of stays in these wood trays so um it is attractable um when you ask a bee as they're coming into these uh, this big mass array of holes, which one is theirs? Uh, it gets a little tricky for a bee. You'll see masons and leafcutter bees go into hole. It's like, mm, nope. Next hole, mm, nope. Uh, third hole, there's the charm. And so they'll do that a lot. And because of this, a lot of times the bees will just fly away because it's frustrating. Um, when you use reeds, each reed is unique and it's easier for the bees as they fly into the house just to see their reed and off they go um just bee tubes yeah they they work and rather than having a pile of them all put together i might take the um holes and kind of make them cattywampus and put sticks between them just to make it um uh, differentiated we do have a thing called wayfinders that are um, nice Nice coordination. Wayfinders is just a way of putting them inside wood trays or the bee tubes. They just kind of add color. One for the humans, it looks nice, but for the bees, it's like saying, oh, um, I'm to the left of that little, you know, yellow stick. And it just gives them a little orientation for when they're going in. So to summarize, I think the bees are preferring unique looking holes. Uh, we, the humans, are looking for something um, ease of use. You know, so work with your pocketbook if you're starting brand out brand new, um, lean into the reeds. Do that first. If you're been doing this for a few years, wood trays might be the answer. Great. Um, after the bee, this question comes from Arizona. Um, after the leaf cutters lay their eggs in the nesting materials, what do I do with them? Okay. Um, it's a, it's a, 
pronged question. Didn't we have another question there kind of like this about the repeated seasons? Yeah, similar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, all right. So that um, I'll, I'll read that question. Just um, Yeah, read, read that, that one too if you can. Pull that one up. So because leafcutter bees can have multiple generations in a summer, how do you know when to pull the trays and store them for the winter? Do you simply leave them up um, until the fall and then store them? Um, so, yeah, you can combine the answers there. Okay, so uh, what does happen in a warm environment, the uh, females laid her little eggs inside there and those eggs all hatch and consume the pollen she gathered for them. They stay in their little chamber and sometimes, um, I'm saying a, a portion of them, probably a high proportion, stay tight as a larva waiting for next year. Okay. And then some other portion has the bee saying, ah, the larva saying, ah, it's warm. Let me go through development again. And three weeks later, out this bee tunnels, possibly through her cousins that aren't going through there. So it's a little mess. And off they're going to then start nesting again into different holes. In a warm environment, you could have possibly three generations of leafcutter bees. Okay. Um, so we've been learning this you know so we're taking a um industry bee and shifting this into backyards um so when we, we reached out to um some of our, our research researchers out there uh teresa pitzinger wonderful researcher um she said huh well we're not <laughs> we're not used to <laughs> answering questions like this so we've um we're gonna have this together by by june um knowing that this can occur if you're using uh, reeds or tubes, if you see that reed or tube filled, freshly filled, you can take them out with a pair of um, needle nose pliers or forceps or something, tweezers. You can pull that out and put a new one right back in its place. And then I would take that and move it someplace cooler, okay, with the leafy end up and just bundle them up. And if you have the time, if you're uh, playing with wood trays, let the bees do their thing. And even if you do take those um, reeds or tubes out and you're putting them into a, a you know a bee guard bag, um, watch them. You might find even no matter what you do, so it's just gonna be tunneling up. And it's always disappointed at the end of the season to find a bag full of um, dead bees. It's like mm, if I'd only known, I could have given them you know life. So be careful. I mean, it's it's a it's complicated. Um, and so, you know, sometimes it's just easy to let the bees do their thing and, and, and that's just how they work. Is that, and, is that a fair answer, Kim? Yeah. And, you know, I'd say what works for someone in Michigan might be different than what works for someone in Arizona. So it's really, you know, a bit of trial and error, but Learning. eventually you will figure out what works for the bees in your area um, and your climate. So. Mm -hmm experimentation i think what happened last year just even taking notes this is what i observed uh, next year you'll you'll just as we learn how to raise this insect well i think um microecology you know learning what's going on in your little um area is is good mm -hmm. um i'm gonna pull another question from from youtube um so are there any good plants to add to my garden um for leaf cutter bees um, I recently was visiting a, a gardener of wildlife and this guy um, puts plants into his yard and just see um, what bees are using it. And over a period of time, he's put in perennials. And so he's constantly just in, um, in tune with who is on which plant. And so um, while there's we have pollinated partnership p2 is a great organization which has thought this thing through you're looking to add useful plants not showy plants um a lot of the um a lot of the flower industry um, wants you always to buy flowers and so they have flowers that are hybridized that are beautiful might even smell nice but the pollen and nectar has been removed so that these plants can't reproduce so when you're thinking through you're looking for pollinator friendly plants that are local to you. Um, when you're putting them in there, watch, 
just spend a few moments and just kind of see who's using it. If someone's using those things a lot at this time, I would always add a few more. Yeah, and I, I put two sources up here. So both Pollinator Partnership has some eco-regional planting guides as well as Xerces Society. Um, so definitely check those out because it'll let you know what's best to plant native, um, what, what best native species to plant in your area. Um, but for leafcutter bees specifically, um, you know, they're happy with almost any broadleaf deciduous that has like softer leaves because, you know, they do cut them. Um, and it's important to note that, you know, even though they're cutting the leaves, like they're not going to kill the plant. They're not doing that much damage. So you'll see nice little circles cut out of there, but your plants will be just fine. Um, we get that question a lot too. Yeah. And, and to that end, to, I don't think that was asked as a question. Uh, what leaf does a leaf cutter bee look for? Um, they're looking for not fuzzy, not thick, something that they can um, snip carefully, a little circle out of there, and with, so it's not too not too um, veiny. And so plants like a uh, hosta, um, lilac, uh, rose, uh, strawberry, pea. If you look at any one of those leaves and say, you know. Look at them and just say, oh, it's, it's a leaf like that. In my yard, um, I get to take an awful lot of bees home that don't go out. So I have thousands of these leaf cutters at my house. I can't find out where they're getting their leaf bits from. I mean, I've got a wild yard and I'm not super big. I'm just like on a quarter acre. And unless I've trained them all to pull, I mean, I just can't find out what they're getting their, their so they aren't, what they're pulling their leaves from. So it's not, you know, decimating your lawn. You know, nature has leaves there to be pulled apart, I guess. Yeah. Um, so this question comes from, uh, let me see here, uh, Janine from Washington. Um, and this is an interesting question. So they say, I was successful raising leafcutter bees last summer. Um, but unfortunately, my mason bee raising season was unsuccessful. So I had a lot of larger mason bee reeds mm. still around. Um, and the leaf cutter bees ended up preferring the large mason bee size reeds. Um, so for this in future years, I'm thinking about having both sizes around for the leaf cutters. Do you recommend this? And do you know why they may have preferred the larger size? Um, as this industry progresses, uh, we're, I'm learning more and more. We're learning more and more. Um, the bees that we sell are a, you know, from the leaf cutter industry, and they pr typically prefer a six millimeter hole. Um, there are hundreds of species of leaf cutter bees across the country. Some are in the spring, some are in the summer, and there are big bees and little bees um, all looking for a hole of their size. And so it's possible that the bees that were in her yard are a, a bee that we don't sell, but it's out there using what's in front of, you know, what's in front of her. Um, if a small bee is using a large hole, it takes an awful lot of energy for all these leaf bits to get flown into there. And then trying to get pollen and nectar back there, it's there's so many more trips um, for a small bee in a large hole. It's just inefficient. Um, they, I guess they'll, they'll do what they want to, but it's um, typically bees will know their own size and know what they can carry and typically move towards a, a smaller, we have small little mason bees go in small little holes. They just do because it's most efficient for them. Yeah. So you know, sometimes a bugs, it's just a bug and they're going to do what they want to do. Yeah. It's always cool to put out a variety of sizes too, just to see, you know, what is out there um, because they're happy to share their home um, mm -hmm. with different species of bees. Um, this question comes from both Michigan and Washington. Um, so we have two similar questions and Dave, I'll actually answer this one since I wrote the article on it. Um, so, you know, what experiences have other ha others had using leaf cutters in greenhouses? Um, they seem to be working in mine. And then the other question was, we just built a greenhouse, you know, so it's kind of like, what is, um, what are people finding? Do they work, um, basically? 
So our response would be the short answer is yes. Um, you know, I've done done some research into it, and and researchers have found that you know it both mason and leaf cutter bees can be successful in greenhouses, but it can be tricky. So you know, we've got an article on our website. Let me go ahead and put that up. Um, the QR code. There we go. Um, that will give you a lot more details on this um, than we have time for. So be sure to check that out if you're thinking about putting bees in your in your greenhouse. But basically there are a few things you need to consider. Um, the first one is that your green greenhouse can't have any um, UV blocking shields. Um, bees use polarized light to find flowers and to navigate um, back to their nest. So if you have UV, UV blocking shields, that kind of messes with their navigation. Um, the second thing is if you allow bees to come and go throughout open windows, um, you'll likely find that they'll just go and nest outside somewhere. So if you want them to pollinate your greenhouse specifically, you may need to consider um, some netting um, to keep them in, in the greenhouse, but still allow for airflow. Um, and then you'll need to make sure you have plenty of pollen and nectar inside the greenhouse for your bees to thrive. So. You know, a single bee can visit 2,000 blossoms a day or flowers a day, rather. So, you know, you need to make sure that you've got plenty of pollen and nectar. And if you're trying this with mason bees, you need to make sure that you have a mud source um, as well. And then temperature is another something to think about. So mason bees temps inside in greenhouses need to be between, you know, like 55 and 80 with low humidity. Otherwise, it's too hot. It's too humid for them to survive. Um, leaf cutter bees, as we've been talking about, they're okay in hotter temperatures. So if your greenhouse is pretty warm, um, leaf cutters may do well there um, and you might not do so well with mason bees. Um, but it's really, it's again like trial and error to see what works for your greenhouse, but it definitely can be done. Um, so if you are doing it and have success stories, we would love to hear them. So make sure you reach out if you're like, I've been very successful with bees in my greenhouse. We'd love to, to pick your brain about um, what you're doing. Right. Yeah. So hope that helps with the greenhouse question. Thanks, Kim. Um, this next question is from um, Elizabeth from Ontario. Um, and they ask, if leaf cutters are naturalized to my area, why do I need to bring in my nesting box and materials to overwinter? Why can't I just clean the bee house and put the nesting box and materials back out in the spring? Uh, what we've learned over time, um, when you're aggregating all of your nesting material in one tight space, this isn't natural. Nature has holes far apart in, in broken off stems, in old tree scags that um, are all fall apart. So it's, it's hard for pests to find all of these, you know, um, wonderful bee larvae. When we pull them tightly together, man, you've got these parasitic wasps. All my food's right here. So Terramalis just crawls down even filled tubes and just lays their eggs right through this, the side walls. And so they're wonderful at, at killing things. When you've got a uh, chalk brood, it's just, it stays in and out of the same place. Um, if you are having your holes far apart, sure. But if you're aggregating, this human want to everything tight together um, is should have you question pests build up. And over time, while you think this looks good, when you open it up, you just find um, less and less bees. This is a good mason bee lesson. It's also a good leaf cutter lesson. So um, if you want to play natural, the holes should be scattered in your yard. If you want to play human and make it easy, then um, learn to manage. Great. Or they'll fail. Um, and this question also comes from Elizabeth, and I, I like this question because we get it a lot. Um, if I attract other native bees to nest in my bee house, how do I identify them? And then do I follow the same protocol for cleaning and overwintering the cocoons? I just learned a good lesson from this um, person. Um, one, you can find out, um, we're putting this video together, but um, this guy was physically pulling um, tubes out that were capped 
with a species that he saw the bee going in and out. So he actually put on there and put down, you know, LC for leaf cutter or PR for whatever his name, this other type of bee was. So he was constantly pulling out. So he knew in his actively managed house, which bee was which. Okay. Um, that was intense. It was certainly an, an, an eye opener for me. Um, I would always have in my yard, small, medium and large um, nesting holes. I would be always encouraging in my yard different types of flowers that are blooming all season long so that as bees and wasps will use these solitary wasps, um, I'd be in tune, try to be in tune with these. So I'm, um, uh, our capped end guide that Kim has up here is a wonderful thing to give you a clue for which species is there. Um, and then maybe being just a little aware that um, as these nests and holes have filled up, maybe you just take them out and, you know, rubber band them and, and you've grouped them by week or by month. So you just have a feel for that. So then we're putting these things out the following year. You know what was happening when. My two cents. Okay. And I'm still learning. Sorry, Dave. I was, I was playing with the buttons. Um, you mentioned that they should separate them from everything that you know. Um, right. So pull them out, put them in a separate bag. Then you can see just kind of what is emerging and what that looks like and all of that. But they are separate from, you know, what you know to be a leaf cutter bee or a mason bee, just in case it does happen to be. Stay um, in tune. Right. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so that leads us into uh, pests and things in nesting material. So this is the last group of questions that we have. Um, and we do only have about 10, 15 minutes left. So um, just to keep an eye on the time. Um, this question comes from Ohio. Um, and the question is, I'm wondering what the tiny black beetle-like bugs are that come out of the leaf cutter bee tubes or cocoons? I'm going to say bugus beetle. Um... <laughs> If we didn't, if you don't find that, um, this site here uh, that Kim has pulled up has most of the insects that we are aware of. But again, you're, you're aggregating all these nesting holes there. And there's going to be bugs around you that come in, stay all season long. If you haven't harvested, they're going to be coming out. Um, if you don't find this picture in our website, let us know uh, what you found. Send us a picture. We'd love to just constantly add to uh, what things could be inside there. Uh, we really um, want to collectively get a list of solutions for people out there. And um, part of it is, you know, if there's a parasitic wasp going down there, ah, you know, they're smush them while you can. Um, in the leaf cutter, um, alfalfa leaf cutter industry, they're, <laughs> My one of my friends was a kid. His dad said, "Son, you just sit underneath there during the day and just smush these things. I'll pay you, you know, to smush these parasitic wasps because they're just always in there." Um, being aware of when these are coming in, or if they're coming out, um, we think loose cocoon management is a good solution. And uh, if you see. Um, I'd be pulling my tubes out of um, the environment if I think there's parasitic wasps around and put them into a bee guard bag, something that you can see through, fine mesh bag, um, and just keeping your eye on those. You'll find that um, you might have missed something as you put in these filled bags away or filled, you know, filled tubes away in this bag. Uh, sometimes a parasitic wasp or someone else might have just come out and is now in there trying to go do things, and you can smush that bug through the bag um this is a awful lot of fun food for a host of other insects in this eat and get eaten world so it's you know when we're trying to protect the insect that we want we have to keep our eyes open yeah and then this is kind of similar it's another um pest question uh this question comes from quebec um indian meal moths seem to be able to get through my bee guard bag um what do i do to prevent these pests Pests specifically, um, and how can I protect my bees while incubating and during storage? Um, and I would say that um, it's not that the um, moth or the um, caterpillar stage can get through the bag. They started in there. And so 
as it uh, as the moth laid its eggs within um, on you know in the sources there the uh, larva has come out now it's a very destructive insect and just plows right through every single hole so um, the awareness that I've pulled my tubes out of the environment I've protected them into something that I can see through and the knowledge that you're just kind of watching this sometimes we'll also find that you know in another season a bee comes out or who knows what shows up and it somehow it snuck in there and it's it's coming back out and it might be um might be a solitary beneficial wasp you know some things you know we typically have pictures on our website but just the awareness that this is going on might be an answer great um and then this question comes from dennis from florida um and they have two issues one being carpenter bees the other being stink bugs um, and the question is, do these species interact in any way, beneficially or otherwise, with mason and leafcutter bees? Um, and then said, my neighbor showed me that they can easily be dispatched with an old tennis racket when you're tired <laughs> of them damaging your home. There we go. Yeah, so what's your answer on that? Stink bugs are another story. They're just, you know, Stinky. they don't, don't care for those much. Um, so if you don't mind, Dave, I'll answer this question. Um, so the, the good news is, you know, neither carpenter bees nor stink bugs will cause harm to your mason or leafcutter bees. Um, so they don't, they don't really interact at all. Um, but we understand that they're not always welcome. Um, we get this question a lot with carpenter bees. So we did create this eight simple ways to prevent carpenter bees from moving in um, post. So, you know, if carpenter bees have decided to call your home their home, it can be really tempting to um, use insecticides or an old tennis racket um, to kill the bees. But we do urge you try less harmful techniques first. Um, you know, for carpenter bees, they're native bees. They're really efficient um, buzz pollinators. Um, but we also don't want them destroying our homes or our fences or our patio furniture. Um, so check out this blog post because it does have a lot of different bee friendly ideas to um, keep the carpenter bees um, at bay and stop them from becoming a nuisance, but still benefit your yard with their pollination. Um, just a couple of techniques that you can try. Um, carpenter bees do not like almond and citrus oil. So you can create like an almond citrus oil water solution and either spray where just a preventative spray. You don't want them nesting there. You, so you can spray that um, before they start flying or when you start to notice them flying. You can also spray it around um, the holes if you see, you know, that they're actively nesting there um, and that might cause them to, to abandon their nest. Um, you can also provide homes specifically for carpenter bees. They like old weathered wood. So if you just take like a piece of old weathered wood and put it, you know, in the corner of your yard away from your house or your patio furniture where you don't want them, um, you know, they may just go and live over there. And, and take a drill bit that's a half inch drill bit and just put a couple little at a 45 degree angles up just start some holes for them you start a holes. more yeah you know, some starter holes make it more attractive yeah and then the the last thing um i have read that has been known to work um it depends on whether or not you like this idea but hang a wind chime near the carpenter bees nest because so, the the sound and the vibrations um will annoy them enough that they will leave there we um, go. so it may annoy you enough that you will not want to hang the wind chime but you know it is another tactic that has been used. So those are some ideas um, to help with with carpenter bees. As far as stink bugs, they're not native, I yeah, don't believe. I think um, so, but they're not going to harm your bees. So it's, do yeah, do what you will with the stink bugs. I, I mm -hmm. was looking here on the side. Liz E asked the question: Are all of these bee parasites non-native, or are there some of these insects that have? Uh, symbiotic or other relationships okay. with the bees that we may not be unaware of. That's a great question. It is a good question. Um, yes, is is part of the statement. Um, some of them are imported. Some of them are naturalized. Um, in some all of cases, them are native. Right. Some are some are native. Some are naturalized. Mm -hmm. So part of this frustration of globalization is well, they're here. Okay, and I think the awareness that when we aggregate a lot of stuff in one tight space, it is an attractive source of food for pests, 
And so I think the awareness, Houdini fly is a mess that we're dealing with on the honey, on the Mason bee side. Um, I'm sure there are, uh, I, I don't know when the uh, Terra Malis came in, but I think it could have been European or it could be a, a species that are here, but it's a mess for the uh, leaf cutters. Our, our pest and, and disease guides um, on our website do highlight which ones are native and which ones are not. Um, so if you read through that, it'll give you an idea. Because, I mean, you know, predator prey relationships are important. Um, so while we want the bees to all survive, um, if we lose a couple to native predators and they've, you know, evolved together, uh, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think the real reason is when we, nature wants um, not any of one species all put together. So when there's an aggregated pile of, of something, nature says, nah, you shouldn't do that. And and they move pests in there to kind of bring it down to something that's, you know, more manageable for nature. But when you and I are trying to put a lot of pollen out here, that's more than natural, you know, us at the top of the food chain, what we want. And so, you know, we are working against nature by putting all of this loaded pollen out there. We're fighting the bunnies and the caterpillars to, that are eating that. Same thing that happens, you know, now you've got your aggregated food sources here. Of course, your pests are going to move in because that's just what nature does. Too much of one thing feeds the other. Great. Okay. Um, so that we don't get accidentally cut off like we did with our Mason Bee Live Q&A, um, I think we are going to wrap it up. Um, but I do want to thank everybody for joining us and bringing your questions. And I also want to just highlight again that we have a ton of additional resources on our website. Visit our Leaf Cutter Bee, um, Bee Knowledgeable page. You can, all of your questions can be answered there. And if they're not, because we do miss things once in a while, um, this QR code here links to where you can submit your question. Or if we didn't get a chance to get to your question today on the live Q&A, um, you can just scan that or visit our um, help center on our website and fill out the ticket and we will get back to you with an answer as soon as we can. So um, again, thank you and visit our website and good luck with the bees. Dave, any final words? Um, no, I guess the fun part is, um, yes, I'm so I guess, yes, I have a, a, a <laughs> word. Um, years ago, I'm out in DC at some huge big science confer conference of all these entomologists across the country, all trying to solve pollination something. And in two days, all honeybee, five minutes of bumblebee and the word mason bee was said one time. And you move this forward and slowly but surely you see uh, mason bees more in mainstream. And then uh, our company said, hey, let's bring in this, you know, industrialized um, leaf cutter bee. And you see it in mainstream media from nothing to rarely to occasionally to, um, it's now out there. And I think more and more people are learning that you can have spring and summer bees. And it's just exciting to see the industry um, of, of backyards learning that they can you know have other creatures used in their houses so this is fun it's a it's a wonderful um it's wonderful to be in this company with people like kim i enjoy and kylie thanks for answering questions guys yeah and i i did, meant to put this up earlier but you know um just as a thank you for joining us today there's a, a code you can uh, put on your next order and get 10% off whatever you order from us. Um, just as a, if you wanted to watch this before getting started with leaf cutters, this will help you out. So, all right. Thanks and happy. Thanks Bye. guys.